Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, yeah, um, it's all correct. Uh, I'm a PhD student with Hildegard Uecker um, here in Plön. And um, I'm very glad for the opportunity and I would like to thank the organizers for um, this um, very nice workshop. So let me start. Okay, I hope you see my slide. Um, so and as it was already mentioned um, a few times in the workshop, um, I, I think I do not have to say that there's uh, many plasmids with, uh, multi, with multiple copies. So um, experimental studies from the recent um, years have shown that uh, multi-copy plasmids potentiate the evolution of antibiotic resistance. So, um, so um, Alvaro Samilan um, and colleagues, for example, um, showed in a paper from 2016 for E. coli um, with a plasmid that has a plasmid copy number of 19, that it evolves resistance against um, high antibiotic concentrations. So here shown on the right side, where um, this is more likely um, if the resistance gene that is evolved um, is on the multi-copy plasmid, here shown in black, um, then if um, the involved resistance gene um, is on the chromosome, where uh, no antibiotic resistance could be um, seen for those um, large concentrations in this antibiotic ramp experiment where the population was transferred to increasing concentrations. So there are many reasons why this should be the case. So first, there is a, a mutational, increased mutational target for genes um, on the multi-copy plasmid. Um, second, there are gene dosage effects um, that can lead to a higher degree of resistance um, if the resistance gene is on the plasmid. Um, and more generally speaking, um, that's why I also um, put this other reference here, um, there's advantages of um, possible coexistence of several plasmid variants within a single cell to, for example, escape fitness trade-offs um, as shown um, in this paper by Rodriguez Beltran and others. So before I start, let me just give you a quick outline of my talk. So in the first part, I will show you some results of a mathematical study that we did that exactly deals with this scenario I just um, depicted on the evolution of antibiotic resistance on multi-copy plasmids. Um, and in the second part of my talk, I'm going to um, elaborate a little bit on the fixation dynamics on multi-copy plasmids. So the question that interested me most when I um, read this uh, paper by um, Alvaro Samilan was, um, how does the probability of evolution of antibiotic resistance actually depend on the plasmid copy number? And um, to answer this, we built a mathematical model um, where we assumed that there is a susceptible population of bacteria declining due to an antibiotic stress. And by some chance, a de novo mutation, so here depicted by this plasmid copy that has um, a different color, arises just on a single copy. Um, and in the model, um, plasmids replicate. Um, um, and, and at the same time, um, the plasmid copies replicate. So um, before cell division, plasmid copies are distributed to the daughter cells. And for this case, there's two outcomes. So either there's an equal distribution of the, the um, plasmids with the two variants, or there's a segregation of the um, mutant plasmid, the mutant resistant plasmid. So um, basically all our analysis came back to, to the one question and that was like, can a single cell or um, what is the probability that a single cell can rescue the population? And we found that there is two factors that I want to kind of um, have as a, as a general picture. So um, the first factor is due to a large copy number, the cell will likely um, or more likely produce progeny that has resistance mutations. And the other factor, is stochastic loss, um, which means that mutations arising on a multi-copy plasmid, so 
um, a, a, a plasma with a greater um, number um, is more likely. Um, so um, the establishment probability, so um, this is uh, P, the establishment probability is actually exactly the inverse of the probability of stochastic loss. And this has a certain dependence on the plasmid copy number and it often decreases. While the other factor, so what I call the mutational supply in the following is increasing. And with this, we um, use uh, the framework of evolutionary rescue and, and formulate this basically as a, as a single equation um, that has a dependence on the copy number n. So let me show you two examples. Um, um, so in the first example, the resistant mutant allele is dominant. And what does this mean? So um, I have here on the x-axis, also depicted by those small bacteria um, in the example of copy number three, uh, the number of mutant plasmids within the cell. And um, for the case of what I call a dominant mutation, the cell fitness increases with um, the first mutant copy. And um, no matter how many mutant copies there are within one cell, um, the reproductive fitness is the same. So as I already said, mutational supply is increasing with a copy number, but as our analysis show, um, that we do with a, a multi-type branching process, the establishment probability, so the inverse of, of the stochastic loss, the establishment probability that a cell leaves a lineage that rescues the population in the end declines with a plasmid copy number. Um, but in total, so the probability of, um, of rescue of uh, antibiotic resistance evolving is an increasing function um, no matter of uh, how uh, large the uh, effect of this resistance mutation is. In the, in the second example, um, I'm going to show you the same result for recessive mutation. What means that only a cell that has only mutant copies is, um, is resistant and has a, a positive Malthusian fitness. So for, for this, we see here shown um, the establishment probability over the plasmid copy number, um, a strong decline. And this leads basically to a, a general trend of a decreasing rescue probability with the plasmid copy number. Um, so I hope that this um, kind of convinces, of course, with many assumptions that we make in our mathematical model, that is only boils down to the single equation that the dominance relationship is actually a decisive factor for resistance um, evolution on multi-copy plasmid. And a follow-up question we asked was, um, how does the dominance of resistant alleles on a multi-copy plasmid is actually shaped? And I'm not going too much into detail here. Um, we have built a, a small model of um, antibiotic degradation, and we look here in, on two scenarios. And in the first scenario, the production of antibiotic degrading enzymes is costly. And we model this by a degradation rate that depends on the relative number of relative compared to uh, uh, of, of mutant compared to wild type plasmid copies. And for this here shown rescue probability over the antibiotic concentration, we see that um, greater copy numbers here shown in red um, are optimal only for the low concentrations. So um, in the other scenario we looked at, plasmids are costly, um, where um, the, the, the plasmid cost decreasing reproductive fitness is an increasing function with the plasmid copy number. And here the exact opposite shows, where the greater copy numbers, again shown in red, are optimal only for the higher concentrations. And this is, um, although we cannot really um, compare exactly um, with um, the data I've shown in the beginning, um, a similar trend to what, what we see here, where for the, the medium concentrations, we see that actually um, the high copy number plasmid is, is not optimal compared to the chromosome and only for um, the high concentrations we see um, the, the optimality of the 
high copy number or the, the multi copy plasmid. Okay, so um, this brings me directly to um, the second part of my talk. And here we have the question, how long does it take until a beneficial mutatious, mutation reaches fixation? And this is um, interesting, like in, in, in face of uh, the maintenance of um, uh, wild type uh, um, plasmid, um, as we will see in the following. So um, let's jump right into the model. So we consider a population that um, has a small fraction of cells with a single beneficial um, mutant uh, plasmid copy, for example, um, due to a transfer uh, event. And cells with a mutant replicant um, uh, copy here have an increased fitness, one plus S. Um, so this is the analog to a dominant uh, mutation. And in the scenario where there's multiple copies within a, within a cell, it is possible that there is a time point where all um, cells in the population have the beneficial phenotype, um, but um, the wild type is still in the population. So um, whereas what we call allele fixation, there is a time when the homozygous mutant is um, fixed and um, the wild type is lost from the population. And we call this um, difference in the time the heterozygosity window. So um, let me show you just one example um, of um, how we analyze this. So um, if we have a copy number of one, so um, there is only one plasmid um, copy in the cell, we only have um, homozygous um, mutant cells, no heterozygosity, right? Um, and we see here that after a very short time, mutant cells, and, and those are homozygous um, cells, they will rise to fixation. Um, so phenotype fixation and allele fixation, they coincide. But if we look at the um, same result of this deterministic model, where we um, basically have a proxy here for fixation for copy number 32, um, we see that uh, fixation of the mutant um, cells is way earlier compared to the homozygous mutant cells due to also um, a rise of the heterozygous cells in the meantime. And um, we can show that um, for a certain degree of uh, selection, um, that is S with an uh, um, arbitrary unit, um, this um, heterozygosity render arises if S is greater than um, the inverse of the copy number N. And for this, we can show that this heterozygosity when this approximately scaling with N times the natural logarithm of N. So um, what one should um, definitely keep in mind, and um, um, I've mentioned this in the first part of my talk, we, we assume here some random segregation of the plasmid copies to its daughter cells. And the fixation dynamic is, is depending strongly on the plasmid segregation mode. So um, we, for example, look at, um, in our model, um, at uh, some clustering of sister replicants where the plasmid does not resolve before it goes to um, the daughter cells. And here it shows that this, for example, reduces both the fixation times um, at the two levels of phenotype and of the genotype, but also the heterozygosity window. Whereas if we have um, a separation of sister replicants, as for example, often assumed for, for low copy plasmids, where um, plasmid copies are pushed to um, the, the, the uh, two daughter cells, we only see a rise of uh, heterozygous cells up to fixation. Um, so um, let me come to a summary. Uh, so for the first part, I um, have shown you that the dominance relationship plays a, a crucial role in um, the uh, evolution of antibiotic resistance of multi-copy plasmids. And um, we have seen that um, the optimal copy number is actually um, often depending on the antibiotic concentration, uh, which uh, shapes the dominance uh, relationship. So 
um, um, for the second part, where we look at the fixation dynamics, I've shown you that um, we see a rise of heterozygous cells um, causing a, a heterozygosity window, as we term it. Um, and of course, there um, should be um, um, always mentioned that the uh, segregation mode of the plasmid is crucial for the fixation dynamics. So um, with this, I would like to thank my supervisor, Hildegard um, and um, Tal, Anne, Anna, and for the plasmid illustrations, I would like to thank Fena Stücker. Thank you. Okay, I'm back. Thank you, it was really interesting. So let's see if I can see if there are questions. Yeah, there is Olivia. Please, Olivia, go on. Hi, yeah, thanks, Ella. Um, really great talk, Mario. Really like the work, it's very interesting. Thank you. Um, I have a few questions. So in your first vignette, when you looked at dominance and recessive relationships, did y'all investigate the in-between architecture where it scales potentially yeah. your phenotype of your cell with number? Yeah. Because that's so more the, similar to the beta lactamase mm, mm, work of Alvaro where gene dosage is happening. So there is two relationships um, that are, I would say, mainly important. And we call those intermediate, where it's something between dominant and recessive. And um, for this, it, it actually gets messy if you go to copy numbers uh, greater than two. <laughs> um, where you see um, also an, an, an optimal copy number um, for the um, for the for the intermediate, um, so not for the high but not for the low um, copy numbers, um, where rescue gets most likely if you if you choose an inter intermediate um, uh, intermediate copy number, and the second is a gene dosage effects. Um, uh, that um, people often assume also when it comes to beta lactamases, as I also mentioned at the beginning, um, where you see establishment probabilities um, that can also rise with a copy number. So in the two examples I've shown, dominant and recessive, we only see the establishment probability falling. But for the gene dosage effects, where, for example, you need um, um, two out of two copies that have the mutation to get a cell population growing, um, um, of course, it, it, it can be um, a benefit to have a greater copy number because then you can actually increase um, the reproductive fitness um, with greater copy number. Does this answer your question? Mm -hmm. That was my first question, but I'll hold off on my second just oh, in case other people have There's questions. no other hands raised. <laughs> Okay, well then I selfishly am going to ask. Um, so beta lactamase is an interesting gene dosage slash kind of more dominant genetic architecture, but that's a type of like specific resistance mechanism. So do you know of any genetic architecture for plasmid genes that have shown to be recessive when it comes to mutations? So um, there are genes but i um so i cannot um i i do not have any examples for the plasmids basically um um or or where it was shown for the plasmid that the dominance is that case but uh let me quickly look if i can okay um maybe maybe i can um send you just references um because yeah, that'd be great. I, I yeah. should I should not name any genes <laughs> because that's um, really <laughs> um, where I can like start making mistakes here. <laughs> yeah, that's totally fair. I was just, I was just selfishly interested in how genetic architecture of mutations might be related to the function of the gene itself, um, and beta lactamase being like a free floating monomeric enzyme if you increase the activity mm -hmm. of it and had some you know, wild type enzyme around and some enzyme that is like better, that obviously like leads to kind of like the intuition of dominance. Anyway, so it's just sure. curious about what- Yeah, genetics thanks for the question. Means. Yeah, thank you. Really great. Thanks. Okay, so I had a question, but I will send you an email because it's uh, too complicated and I think I need to write it. Um, and uh, we should be on break until, uh, 
what's the time until 4 p.m. So you have seven minutes. Well, we will wait. It's Italy. <laughs>